Hello, friends, and welcome to the Reclamation Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Colleen Johnson, and I'm here to guide us in raw conversations about thriving in life and work so that together we can step into personal agency and stop letting life happen to us. We'll cover topics like health, boundaries, communication, finances, and worthiness. That badass business you've been dreaming of, it's not so far off. The desire to wake up feeling fully alive, it's right around the corner. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, Today, I have Mitch and Rachel Johnson here with me. Uh, They're videographers, photographers, students, and alternative income junkies. So (laughs) I'm going to let them kind of speak a little bit to that and what that means for them. Um, So could you guys kind of just introduce yourself and share um, a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my name's Rachel, and um, I have my husband, Mitch, here. Um, So, yeah, we have a business called Mitch and Rachel Visuals. Um, We do photography and videography, um, mostly weddings, but we also um, work with businesses and uh, do family shoots, engagement shoots, and just random projects like that. Um, and then Mitch is currently getting his MSW. So maybe you can tell about that. Yeah. I'm almost done with my master's of social work degree. So I'm kind of split in time between full-time student work and part-time doing Mitch and Rachel visuals in probably four days. I'll be done with that. And then it can go full-time this summer. Mm-hmm. So which is then, super exciting. Yeah, I can't wait. It's been too long. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, and then, yeah, I've never been called an alternative income junkie before, but yeah, that is a it's pretty so good... It's so Rachel. It is so Rachel. It's a good description. Um, so, yeah, basically, we have just, you know, used some creative ways to um, make some money in the last few years um, just to help us kind of have a little more financial freedom um, and not feel like, you know, when we've had some slower seasons, we're not as worried because we have um, certain income that's already coming in. So that's been really helpful for us. And yeah, we can go into some detail of what that all entails later on, but yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, So then a little bit about how we met, which um, is kind of funny because we're family. So um, Mitch is my husband's brother. um, And I was trying to think like actually when we met. And I honestly don't remember when I met you, Mitch. It was, I'm sure it was sometime in college. Just a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. You guys were sophomores or freshmen. I want to say I I had to be like sophomore or something. I transferred in. So yeah. Um, So I was trying to think back and I couldn't remember a specific moment, but I do remember the first time we kind of all, all four of us hung out together. We did something in Chicago, Rachel, you were visiting from Knoxville where you were going to college Mm -hmm. and we kind of just spent the day wandering around. I believe that was the first time we kind of all hung out. Yeah. And Alex, got us lost a few times, which is funny. I just remember that distinctly, like us just like wandering around. Um, I know. And it was just super fun. I remember getting lost and deep dish pizza. And yes. that made the day great. Just those yeah. two things alone. So <laughs> it was so fun because I'm pretty sure we, like Mitch and I started dating within weeks of you and Alex starting dating. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Um, so it was just so funny because we're both like, pretty new like relationships happening yeah, um, yeah. And meeting each other was really fun but it yeah. was definitely a foreshadowing of lots of adventures we've had since and right. and continue and to have we know <laughs> yeah so fun yeah Um, so this is kind of a cool conversation because it's my first podcast episode with a couple. Um, so far I know in the first episode I did with Austin Saylor is interesting because he kind of integrated a little bit of his wife's story, which was really cool. Um, but you guys are the first where I'm actually recording both of you together, which is awesome. Um, yeah. So I know What's also neat about that is you both have very intentional choices kind of around your work and your lifestyles. Rachel, you already kind of spoke a little bit to that. And 
I'm really excited to chat through and hopefully expand some mindsets around how couples, we can really come together and kind of be on this journey of thriving in life and work together versus, you know, kind of being on our own individual paths or feeling like we can't necessarily have our, our work and life kind of intertwine. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think kind of bringing that together is going to be really cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as you guys know, part of why I started this podcast is to help share some of the stories that we all have as we're kind of on this journey, because really, there, you know, there's so many ups and downs they are all over the place. But from like Instagram and from Facebook or, you know, just one conversation, we don't always get to hear the in-depth aspects of people's stories. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I would love to have you guys, if you're willing to just share a little bit about your stories, how you've gotten to be where you are, um, a little bit about the good things, but then kind of also what those like deeper moments have felt like for you and kind of what has been your experience as you kind of stumbled your way through to be where you're at right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. You want to go first? Um, Sure. Um, So. I I feel like this is going to be a really long story. I was going to say, we might need a whole podcast <laughs> episode just with this. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Do a concise version. Right. Um, so I got interested um, with video in high school um, through my church, actually. Um, and by the time college came, video was really the only thing that I could like one of the only things that I truly enjoyed and that was, you know, a hobby or something that I could possibly make a job in the future. Um, so yeah, I just looked around, um, at certain colleges that had videography programs and, um, found a school, um, Johnson university in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, went there and, Um, really enjoyed um, my education, um, did some internships. Um, One specifically was uh, coming to Rockford, Illinois, where I met Mitch. So that that (laughs) worked well. Yeah, thank you for that internship. (laughs) Um, But it's funny because as I was in college, I really had no idea what I was going to do with video. when I had used it in high school, it was, I was doing live production. Um, so I, I mean, I thought about, yeah, I could, you know, work for a news station or yeah, like a TV company or something like that. But I really didn't have any idea of where I was really headed with um, my video degree. Um, so it was kind of funny. I graduated and moved to Illinois from Tennessee. We got married. We bought a house all within a few months. Um, And the last thing that I was really focusing on was what am I going to do? I mean, Mm -hmm. after graduation, it's kind of like this eye-opening moment of, oh my gosh, I'm like supposed to actually use this in some capacity. (laughs) Like that scared me so much with all of the life change that was happening. there were so many transitions and I think I sort of turned that off um, because I was probably scared to try and fail um, Mm -hmm. if I really think about it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I also did a lot of nannying in high school. And so when I got the opportunity to nanny, um, I took it because it was something I knew and wasn't as scary. So I did that for about a year and a half after we got married. I really enjoyed it. I loved the family that I worked with. Um, But I definitely knew, like, deep down, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, it's fine for now. But like, why? Like, I'm, I'm scared of what's next. And I think I'm, I think I realized that I was um, just a little nervous of what came next. And I think just of failing in that. Um, So I kind of stayed in that. place of just the safety zone. Um, and basically that ended when, um, they no longer needed me. Um, so I was kind of shocked. I wasn't expecting that. Um, but at this point, Mitch and I had already been asked to do some 
weddings for certain friends. And it was almost like life catapulted us into the season of starting our own business. And I had to decide um, when they told me they didn't need me to nanny for them anymore. Am I going to go and find another nanny job or something that you know, makes me feel comfortable and Mm -hmm. something I know, or am I gonna like, give it all I've got and, you know, start our business. Like, at this point, we were literally doing nothing to market ourselves, no social media, um, nothing, just nothing at all. We weren't doing ads anywhere, or even just promoting our name to people. It was just like, yeah, that's something we do every once in a while. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, we decided that I was going to go full force, um, with our business. And it was sort of that like crazy season that, that brought us into where we are. Um, it was really scary. And I was honestly, um, I think I had wanted to start our social media, um, and promoting ourselves a little earlier, but again, I was scared to fail. If people knew that I was actually trying to do this instead of just like, oh yeah, we do it sometimes and then mm-hmm. things didn't go well, then I was going to be a failure. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I kind of had to get over that. Um, and it's been the best thing ever. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. sort of brings us up to date um, to where we are now loving our business. And I can't imagine going back to a normal nine to five in any capacity. So mm-hmm. yeah. That's yeah. Me. The goal I think, never get back to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so interesting how most I I don't want to say like everyone's story, but so many stories we like reach this point where it's like, okay, well, can I am I going to take the leap in this? Right. And like, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's almost like we have this force of some kind where something happens and we're just put into that position. Like, okay, I can either go for this mm-hmm. or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have to choose something because, you know, with, for you, it was your nanny job ended. And so it was like, okay, like now I have to do something. Yeah. And we, we reach that point. And, um, so often I think when we do take the leap, it's so worth it. Um, and, you know, there's always additional journeys along the way, right? but every step is just a little bit closer to becoming like who we are meant to be, which is really cool. Yeah, totally. Like, I'm so thankful that, you know, life happened in the way that they no longer needed me at that time. I felt pretty lost, honestly. It's like all of a sudden the job I've had for a year and a half isn't going to be happening anymore and what does that mean and Mm -hmm. yeah it was just um crazy how that happened and I'm so thankful for it now it's crazy that a a time that you feel so lost catapults you into um something that is so meaningful Mm -hmm. and you know provides so much growth Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah that's awesome um and then Mitch yeah do you want to share a little bit of yours I know your story is um, very different. It kind of comes to a, a similar, similar yeah. reality of sorts at the end, but you have a very different story too. Sure. So. It is weird to think that even as a husband and wife, our stories are like completely different, which is like mm-hmm. kind of an interesting concept, I think. But um, yeah, I, one thing to know is that I've pretty much never known what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I think that's kind of an important theme on the choices that I made early on was like, I, I grew up with friends who said since they were three, like, I want to be a hospice nurse and, you know, I won't spend too much time on this, but basically I never had that. And I know there's a lot of people out there like that too. So I started in business. Um, I actually started in engineering, which is not me. So I found that out quick. But <laughs> I, I got my start in business, um, mostly marketing, but also digital media, which was pretty nice because that catapulted me into our business, you know, a decade later. Um, but yeah, I bopped around in the business world a lot for a while. Um, I did work the eight to five. Um, usually it ended up being eight to seven or eight to nine or, you know, something like that. Um, 
But yeah, I worked for a few companies. Um, God bless them. They're great. Um, I actually still enjoy good relationships with a few of them. Um, and they're still, you know, the owners are still in my life, especially one of the small businesses. I really do enjoy that small business atmosphere. Um, but along the way, um, I just kind of realized in my soul that like, I'm not really alive. Um, mm -hmm. This is kind of just what I was told to do. Um, I was told to graduate and use my degree and work nine to five and get insurance benefits and pay off my student loans and um, get, you know, all of these things um, to keep my future secure. And those are not bad things at all. I, I am actually really thankful for that time because I did get to get debt free and all of that stuff. But underneath, um, there was still a lot of sadness and grief um, that I didn't even know was there. Um, because I had this vision or purpose for my life and I wasn't doing anything about it. I wasn't even paying attention to it really because I didn't know what it was. Um, so anyway, um, for years, you know, five, six, seven, maybe years, I was in this, um, kind of flow where I would get into a business and be there for a year or two and then leave and then get into business, be there a year or two and then leave. And, um, it was mostly just because my dissatisfaction with it and burnout um, just prompted me to say, I can't do this anymore. Like, I'm not made for this. I can't do this. So maybe another business or another organization is the answer. Um, but when it all came down to it, that was not the answer at all. It was that I was trying to live the life um, of those around me and trying to fit into that mold when mm -hmm. I'm a very different person than the business world. Um, and I know we're going to go into that a little bit later, but I eventually decided, you know what, enough is enough. Like what, what do I really want to do? And I've had, um, you know, some struggles with mental illness throughout my life, specifically depression. And at this point of my life, it was the worst it's been. Um, I really struggled even finding joy in the things that I used to love. Um, and that's really when you know, like you've hit a place that's not great <laughs> is when you like dread things that you used to love. Um, so I knew I had to make a uh, change and that started with therapy first and found so much help and hope through therapy. Thank God. Um, I met some great therapists and great mentors in my life who really kind of, um, helped work with me and kind of help, um, dead in a few of the perfectionistic tendencies I had, a few of those things. Um, but that really launched me to realize, man, I want to do that with my life. I want to be that for other people. I want to yeah. encourage other people out of this. I want to help people who don't have a purpose, who don't have a vision to get that vision. I want them on fire. I don't want you going to your job just because you have to. I want you to live every day because you know, like, this is my value this is my purpose and I'm intentionally choosing this, not being forced to do this. So um, that's what made me switch, make the huge switch into getting my master's of social work. Um, I'm going a clinical route so I can be a counselor at the end of this. Um, so hopefully I can pass along some of the hope um, with that. So um, while that's all been going on, obviously we've started Mitch and Rachel visuals and and doing stuff like that. I, I go along with every shoot. So I do a lot of the photography. Rachel does a lot of the videography. Um, I really like to have a lot of variety. Um, so it really fits me as a person because I don't get bored. <laughs> if I was mm -hmm. doing the same thing all day, I don't think I could do that. So yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing um, your story in that. And um, yeah, I feel like so many of us have that, that, um, thing where we just, you know, we don't want to get bored and just having different aspects. Honestly, like, I feel like it brings out the creativity that each of us have, mm -hmm. um, which is really, really healthy. Um, super cool. So I know you kind of touched on it a little bit, talking a little bit about burnout and how that affected you. Can you lean into that a little bit more and just dive into it and as kind of more of like a primary topic where um, just share how the nine to five really didn't work for you and what kind of what that journey looked like for you to kind of accept a different structure for work? Sure. 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's ironic because I really do feel burnt out currently. Um, so I was telling Rachel before this, like, I feel like a hypocrite talking about burnout <laughs> when I'm feeling burnt out right now. But um, I think right now it's very different because I have a an end in sight. This isn't forever. <laughs> um, but also, I'm genuinely in burnout. So like, who better to talk about it, I guess, mm -hmm. than someone else. So I relate yeah. to all anyone who's listening who is maybe kind of feeling burned out right now. Um, I think the first time I felt it, I was working as a graphic designer for a software company, and we were in super growth mode and just taking off. We were hiring 20 people in three or four months at one point, um, just really growing and expanding, getting um, getting lots of contracts for major airlines across the U.S. So um, our workload with that just went through the roof. We were not, no one was ready for that expansion, but obviously you're not going to say no to it. Um, so, well, I shouldn't say, obviously I should say my, um, leaders were not ready to say no to that. So, mm -hmm. um, so that put a lot of stress on those under them. Um, and for a while it was okay. Um, we had a buffer, you know, it's, it's not like we lived in burnout for years until we came to the company, that was, I was pretty fresh when I came to the company. Um, but again, eight to five turned into eight to six, which turned into eight to seven, which some weeks would be seven to 10, you know, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And, you know, just cutting, keep um, expanding the time that they needed from us and keep decreasing the time that we had to actually give to like, life-giving things and things we enjoyed and and things we valued like family i was missing so many family events i remember i couldn't go to anything during these um this time of my life and i lost a lot of connections with friends and family and i was kind of all alone except with my coworkers. so um like i said at first it wasn't as bad um you can kind of do it for a while but then after after a bit, it's like your core inside of something inside of you just says, this isn't how I want to live my life. Um, I'm these working in business is not part of my core values as a person. But so why am I giving my core time to this? This doesn't make any okay. sense. This is like totally at odds with each other. Um, so again, referring to what I said earlier, I heard someone say one time that the biggest indicator of burnout is dreading things that you normally love. And while burnout is much more complicated than that, I think that's the best definition I've ever heard because I didn't want to do anything outside of work. I wanted to just sit home, um, either sleep, um, play video games, watch movies, but just be alone. And I, you know, my family would tell you I was the crankiest, meanest person in that season of life than I've ever been. So not to mention I didn't enjoy life, but I made life worse for other people. So I think that's a big thing, too, is that like I a huge core value I have is bringing encouragement to others. And there was no way I could do it in that season. Um, so burnout sucks. It's a terrible feeling. And sometimes it comes on you before you even know it's there. Um, but it's real and it's powerful. And uh, it is uh, not a fun thing. Yeah, for sure. And that's something I feel like you can experience burnout, whether you are um freelancing or working in business or you know, running your own small business really it's it's a it you have to make intentional choices to avoid burnout no matter what your work life yes. looks like mm -hmm. um, yes so that also plugs into this whole boundaries conversation um at that point of my life i didn't know what boundaries were i didn't have them i wasn't intentional about putting them up so because mm -hmm. i didn't do that people did it for me. And when people do it for you, they, <laughs> they're not making healthy boundaries for you. They're making boundaries that benefit them. So um, at least a lot of the time. So um, I didn't tell my bosses, no, like I have a birthday party for my nephew that day. I can't come in. Like a lot of times the yeah. famous line was, you're coming in Saturday, right? Without even any notice. And it, oh, I just wanted to, I got so angry. But I didn't say anything. I, I didn't stick up for myself. I didn't have a boundary there. 
So I just said, yeah, yeah, I'll come in on Saturday because I wanted to be a good employee. Um, but when I really got um, solid on, okay, no, I need, I need boundaries in my life. I'm going to fall apart if I don't keep some things out and keep some good things in. Um, and when I finally started putting those boundaries in place, things really started to change um, for not only me, but everyone in my life. I, I really did become a different person and I had more to give yeah. at the end of the day yeah, that's than awesome. I did before. Um, I always find it so interesting to think about how one mindset, when we like walk into a situation, one mindset of like not having boundaries and kind of allowing people to set those for us versus a mindset of like, okay, I'm going to set this structure for myself and like teach people how they should treat me. Um, it, it sets you up for success in such a different way. Um, but it takes time to learn that it Mm -hmm. takes time to grow and establish that. And sometimes it results in, in losing friendships or losing jobs. Um, but ultimately you can walk Mm -hmm. into a day and feel refreshed and renewed instead of feeling worn out, um, which is the burnout piece. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So kind of leading into the alternative income conversation, Rachel, I would love, so I know you talked a little bit about in your story, how when you started Mitch and Rachel visuals, um, you kind of started pulling from these other income streams as well so that during slow seasons, you can kind of count on these other routes of income. Can you kind of speak into that a little bit and what that's looked like for mm-hmm. you and why, um, why this resonates with you so much more than a traditional nine to five? Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of funny. Like we have our modes of alternative income right now, but thinking back, even in college, I, there was a certain time where I was selling my clothes, like, (laughs) 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 that's so funny. Um, online. I mean, obviously there are a ton of apps now at that point, the only, the one I used was called Vinted. Um, but I was already thinking like, what are some ways I can make some extra money right now? Like I have way too many clothes and I think I made like four or $500 when I was doing it a lot and like trying to clean out my closet from things I didn't wear. Um, So it's funny. That's how it kind of all started. Um, I forget that part of it, but. Which is amazing. I love that so much. (laughs) No, I mean most people have way too many clothes. So if, I mean, I know people that that's their full-time business is using apps like that. Um, There are a lot of, obviously like people on social media you can follow who I know Poshmark is a huge one right Mm now. Um, But yeah, I mean, people go to thrift stores literally to find things that they can resell. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you know the brands and, you know, the market of people you're trying to reach, then you're basically shopping for those people. Um, So, yeah, that's that's super smart. I think that um, is a little more time consuming if you're obviously not just taking random things out of your closet like those people Mm -hmm. are hauling lots of clothes and spending hours out shopping they're really um, making it a business instead of like right, a exactly hobby and I love kind of, that. yeah like we're it's crazy how we have the opportunity to do things like that when I mean even like 10 years ago that like all of these different ways to make money on the side whether it's uber or airbnb or you know, selling your clothes or yeah, Rover, Mm -hmm. any of those sorts of apps. It's just like, we have all of these at our fingertips. And if you're not using it, it's like, I don't, I just feel like it's, you're throwing away such an, such an easy um, way to make some extra money. And um, I think it can be scary to a lot of people. um, But I think it's so worth it in the end. Um, So that brings me to Airbnb, which has been our most successful um, source of passive income, basically. Um, When we were making um, Mitch and Rachel visuals a priority, I, I had high hopes, obviously, that it would go really well, but I kind of, um, 
I wanted to feel a little bit more secure in our finances, Mm -hmm. especially um, I think this was at the time that Mitch was going back to school. So he was starting grad school and coming from a full-time job. So we didn't have that income. I left my full-time job. So we are basically like starting from scratch here. Um, So we had talked about Airbnb for a while and I'm so sad that we didn't start it sooner because we had owned our home for two years at this point and hadn't been utilizing Airbnb. Um, So yeah, we had to put a little bit of time into researching it and getting it all set up, but um, it has been amazing for us. um, Just the fact that we can um, have people stay at our house. Most of the time we don't even meet them because they come in late and leave early and they have their own way to get in the house. And um, it's just such a cool way that like, I just wake up in the morning sometimes and there's an email that says this much money has been deposited into your bank. (laughs) And it's like, okay, I put some sheets on a bed and like made sure our house was clean which like Mitch especially likes that normally (laughs) sometimes he wishes we had more Airbnb people because he's like the house always stays cleaner (laughs) but um yeah it's just I I had no idea what to expect especially living in Rockford Illinois like I we're not a tourist destination (laughs) I'm like honestly I have no idea if people are going to Um, use Airbnb in our city. And we were so surprised with the amount of people who were coming for work. Um, We've had traveling nurses and teachers, and um, we just had someone who was working at a solar plant and just all these really random things that Um, Or people just traveling through, like in the summer, especially people are traveling and doing road trips. And so anyway, that has just been huge for us. Um, And yeah, I feel like it takes a little time to get used to um, making money in in those ways. Um, But I feel like it's just setting us up for more success in the future. when we have kids down the road or like even we've talked about the next time that we buy our house, buying a house that is specifically set up so that we can do Airbnb, Airbnb even better than we already do, you know, Mm -hmm. having a separate apartment attached or just things like that, where we can keep this passive income um, to help us, you know, travel or just, I don't know. It just, it helps us with the less stress of worrying about if it's a slower season, especially winter. I mean, with weddings being our main um, source of income, there are not as many winter weddings. So that's a great time um, for Airbnb. Um, And then also I started using the app Rover, which I think there are a few others that are similar where that's um you know you can watch dogs and um yeah their home or your home your home or you can just walk dogs but that one um definitely didn't take off like airbnb did obviously it's um a different uh pricing too like it's not Mm -hmm. nearly as much um as a night of airbnb but it was something like small that obviously anyone can do. Um, and it was really fun for me and I, I made a good amount of money, um, especially over time, like looking back in the year and seeing how much I made from going out and hanging with someone. I'm like, I would do that for free, but, um, I'm going to pay for it. So that's cool. Um, so yeah, I'm just like, so thankful that we, Um, decided to use those methods um, because they've they've helped us have so much flexibility and um, yeah helped us with our income and for us to not have to worry so much Um, so yeah it's been great that's awesome yeah I know even like for us Airbnb has been really great and 
I haven't done like Rover or WAG. I don't know that I, I would be as good at that. Um, <laughs> but Alex did Lyft for a while. And it, it is, it's amazing how many different apps there are that you can, if, if you get plugged into it and put a little time into learning about it, right. it can be really successful as, you know, an alternative method to get income, whether it's, you know, Alex did that Lyft for a season while he was building up clientele yeah. and like um, Airbnb, we just kind of continued on because it's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we can't forget but, to mention the 19 cents that I've won on HQ. So <laughs> that's a huge part oh, God. of our passive income. That, oh, wow. Well, no, that is not helpful. <laughs> we have spent way too much time on HQ. Yes. Yeah, probably not a recommendation. Yeah. I feel like everyone listening is going to be like, wait, HQ, do people still call right, HQ? Right. Like, that's that's still around. Thinking. We've held out oh, there for way too long that one of us is going to win on one of those nights where you win $20,000. <laughs> but no, we don't put out like question four. But. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, kind of jumping down a little bit here. So along with like all of this, so you've got so many different modes of income that you're kind of utilizing um, between um, weddings and Airbnb and then sometimes using WAG uh, or you use Rover, yeah, sorry. No. I'm used to WAG. So. <laughs> um, so these different things, how do you both kind of establish boundaries around your work life or like student life and then home and personal life? What does that look like for you guys as a couple? I love that question, by the way. Um, <laughs> I think a big one for us is knowing, because as a small business owner, no one tells you when you need to work. So you mm -hmm. have this uh, amazing ability to set your own schedule. But that, I mean, everyone who is a small business owner knows that it comes with the shadow side too, which is you never stop working. Like there's never a time where you can fully let yourself off the hook almost. Um, mm -hmm. and say, no, this is my relax time. Um, I will say the nine to five job, as much as I don't like it, getting off at five does feel good. And knowing that, you know, I'm not going to go into work till nine. That's mm -hmm. not something that mm -hmm. you usually get. So I think for us, um, the biggest one, I don't know if you would agree with that, Rachel, but the biggest one has, for me, has been setting those time boundaries of, okay, we're going to work on this for this amount of hours. Um, I've noticed that we've been working every single night, you know, um, let's take this night, you know, Tuesday night, mm -hmm. let's take five, six hours, set it aside, um, and just enjoy each other mm -hmm. or, or go out, see a movie or take mm -hmm. the family out to dinner or, you know, do something that, you know, refreshes us and energizes mm -hmm. us. And yeah. the, at the same time, if any feelings of guilt come up, just tell ourselves, no, like we earn this time. Um, mm -hmm. This is actually setting us up to do better and accomplish more the next time we come back to the work instead of taking away from the work. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. for me, that's been huge of like really getting into, you know, and that, that takes a lot of self-awareness too it, of like, wow, um, I really feel like I need to rest right now. Or I, mean, mm -hmm. I really need to get with a friend right now. I'm really just feeling lonely or something like that. I mean, it, it does involve a certain amount of paying attention to your emotions and your energy level and your feelings um, to do mm -hmm. that kind of work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, there, there are so many pieces of um, doing a business with someone else, let alone your spouse. Um, and one of those pieces is the fact that we obviously are different people and our personalities are different and our boundaries are naturally different. So figuring out mm -hmm. together what works for us, um, just an example of like, I love traveling so much and whenever we travel, I want my camera in my hand. I want, like, I love that so much right now. I'm just like, I started out with videography right now. I'm into the photography a lot more than I ever have been. And I want to, you know, have my camera and just, you know, you're in a new place. It's exciting. 
And um, realizing from Mitch that that wasn't um, respecting his boundaries of um, like to him that that is working. That is our form of work that we are bringing to vacation so I think it's um it's been a give and take for sure because he he knows that I enjoy that so much and so we kind of just have to have a lot of communication around it it's not like a set in stone this is how it always is but we're almost in constant um conversation of is this okay for us? Does this feel good to you? Does this not feel good? Like, Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we stop talking about it, you know, things go downhill really fast and we feel it in our relationship. So as hard as it is to, um, you know, be thinking of the other person when, you know, you want to do things your own way. Um, it's been really helpful for us to just keep that conversation open um, and respect each other's boundaries. Mm -hmm. Until the line of like, I need to pursue my own boundaries and have like a good amount of that. But also like I'm in a marriage relationship with someone that I care about like the most out of anyone in the world. So like I, there is some flexibility there. Like there Mm -hmm. needs to be. We're two humans Mm -hmm. that have completely different worldviews and different family histories. And Mm -hmm. um, I can't just get my way all the time. So it's been a really humbling Mm -hmm. experience, I think, even just being married, but then getting married and owning a business together is like double humbling Mm -hmm. of like, okay, I'm actually selfish a lot of the time and I want my way. Um, What does this look like me getting what I need while you get what you need? And working together mm-hmm. to that actually brings you and connects you way deeper than if you, like Rachel said, just didn't talk about it or mm-hmm. left it mm-hmm. go on the back burner. Yeah. And another part to that is like, I, I am totally fine working any hours of the day. If I, I mean, that's part of why I love what we do, the flexibility piece of it. But if I want to work straight three hours in the morning and then a few hours in the afternoon, or if I want to not work most of the day and then work most of the night, like I, you know, when the inspiration comes, when the motivation comes, like I'm ready to go for it. And it can be at any point in the day, but Mm -hmm. Mitch, it's very different. And he, um, has these set times that, um, for him are more important. So yeah, just another piece of like learning how to, um, respect each other's boundaries. And even though I don't mind working at nights, if that makes Mitch feel like we don't have quality time, um, and that makes us, you know, temporarily lose our connectedness, um, it's worth it to keep the conversation going, um, so that we can, you know, work as best that we can together because it's not just one of us in this business. It's both of us and we both need to feel good about our work hours. Yeah. And that requires a lot of honesty, vulnerability, and hard conversations that I never want to have. I'm a (laughs) peacekeeper. I hate conflict, but um, yeah, that's been one of the most life-changing things I think we've ever done is being more honest and open about those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think in general, like, um, when you rely on various sources of alternative income, like when it's a little bit less steady, like a nine to five job, I feel like a lot of conversations and difficult conversations have to happen. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that, it is just having open communication, making sure those channels are, you know, you kind of have to let the walls come down so you can hear the perspective of the other person. I really love, I don't remember which one of you said it, how like each person has a different worldview. We've, we've started, we've grown up in different situations and even in a marriage, like it seems like it would be a little easier maybe to establish these conversations, but it's actually like just as hard because we're still coming from very different places and we may see things completely different um, because our perspective is different. So um, yeah, that's really good. That was really, um, 
really interesting to kind of hear how you guys go about that. Yeah. And like at the end of the day, you're not like, if this happens with a coworker after five o'clock, then you kind of have that <laughs> separation um, and like do whatever you need to do before the next day. Right. But it's like, no, we live in the same house and this is our business, but it's also our marriage and our lives. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I sleep with my business owner. <laughs> can't really keep that one. <laughs> oh gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> I think though, like to Rachel's point, I think this topic of vulnerability and honesty and having those hard conversations, like we're human beings. I, I love Brene Brown. At first I shied away from her stuff because I didn't want to hear it. I was too stubborn, but, um, like most people, um, we need to hear what she has to say, this national mm -hmm. conversation around shame, vulnerability, mm -hmm. and how that can bring about um, life change. But I think one of the things she says is so true is that based on her two decades of research, we're not thinking beings who feel, we're feeling beings who think. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of times, um, going back to the burnout conversation, a lot of bosses treat you like a thinking being and leave your emotions at the door. This mm -hmm. is work. Don't be a child. Mm -hmm. um, but the nice part about our business is we actually get to embrace those emotions like, hey, I'm not feeling great today or, hey, I'm really anxious about this project. Hey, like I feel really crappy about this work that I did. And those kind of conversations propel you into so much growth. But I mm -hmm. felt like I could have that in a corporate setting. Um, and it's a yeah. shame because if you can harness those emotions, um, we use a lot of emotion focused therapy in uh, my internship right now at my clinic. So I'm really into emotions right now. But um, if you can harness those emotions, they don't need to be a nuisance anymore. They can actually be mm -hmm. um, really, really crucial in driving business growth, but also personal growth at the same time. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, pretty much everything you just said, I feel like that's the the outline for my whole power, like myths of power that I've kind of been going through in my email yeah. series and yeah. podcast where you know, I started out with kind of the myth of not setting boundaries so you can get good sleep um, and then discussed um, intuition. Um, so that kind of that emotions piece where, you know, sometimes we in the business world, we feel like we have to cut out the emotions. We have to cut out our intuition in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, depending on where you're coming from your perspective. Um, but kind of that conversation. And then last week was about kind of the separation of business and personal and how we're holistic, like we're a whole, we're a whole being. We can't right. really cut ourselves in half. Um, yeah. We have to keep these different things in perspective and remember we need to care for our emotions. We need to learn and understand them, figure out why they're there. What are they trying to communicate right. to us? Because more often than not, there's so much, like you said, it's a, it's a proponent for growth. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you tap into your emotions, um, yeah, I just think so much more goodness can happen versus splitting ourselves into different ways that we're not ever meant to do. Right. Yeah. And <clears throat> that really sparks something in me that you can totally take this out if it's not applicable, but in EFT, emotion focused therapy, we talk all the time about how there's um there's um there's primary emotions and then there's secondary emotions and the secondary emotions are like the tip of the iceberg and what's readily available and what shows on the outside and they're really easy to access and identify so this would be like someone says something hurtful and i get angry that would be a secondary emotion um what's underneath the anger is <laughs> sometimes a little harder to pinpoint um, but usually it's either shame or hurt or something a little bit, something I just don't want to see as much. Anger is much easier um, and much less, um, I don't know, it's more socially acceptable, I guess, for me, especially as a man. Men are usually let, you know, we can be angry for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, don't quite understand that fully, but um, the thing, <laughs> the whole idea behind this is that secondary emotions are not usable. They don't actually do anything for you. 
and all they do is keep you back. It's like a coping mechanism that never actually heals you. Um, it just yeah. keeps you going back in the cycle. Another word for that is maladaptive emotion. It's just something you do, but and it kind of takes care of it, but it never solves the problem. The opposite of that and what we help our clients push towards and what I try and do in our business, in our own lives, um, is to go for the adaptive emotions. These are emotions that we can actually use to grow. We can use it to heal relationships. We can use it to put up boundaries on relationships that don't help us. Um, and those are the kind of things that when I was talking about earlier, we can harness those for business growth mm -hmm. and personal growth. Those adaptive emotions are what I'm talking about. It's it's just amazing when you can see someone shift from anger. Um, sometimes anger can be a primary or an adaptive emotion if it drives you to put a boundary in place. So that can be an adaptive. Um, it just all depends on the situation. So um, mm -hmm. emotions are powerful and emotions can tell us what we need and can be our guide if we're not afraid of mm -hmm. them. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. So good. Love it. <laughs> um, so before we kind of start running out of time here, the last thing I really wanted to talk about, and this is a totally different topic, so we're like shifting gears <laughs> here, <laughs> um, is I'd love to talk, dive into the topic of social media a little bit. Because um, Mitch, you shared you've had a lot of professional experience with social media. Um, and Rachel, you currently run the Mitch and Rachel Visuals social mm -hmm. media. Um, and I know we've kind of all had some past interactions just kind of about showing up as human on mm -hmm. social media versus pushing an agenda. And I would love if you could, um, kind of share your perspective on this. I've really been diving into this a little bit in my myths of power, like mm -hmm. email series, just kind of showing up human really in all facets, like whether we're in our personal lives, whether we're in our business life. Um, and I think a big part of that is showing up human on social media. Um, right. So um, especially in business, we hear a lot, even like um, like on groups and on Facebook groups, I think I see it often. It's people will post like, how can we get around the algorithm? And like, what can we do mm -hmm. to get our posts in front of people? Yeah. Um, when often I think we need to work with the algorithm versus against, uh, we just need to keep showing up as real people. And that's what the algorithm is there to help. Um, right. So yeah, that was a little bit all over the place, but I'd love if you guys can kind of speak to your experiences with this and kind of your thoughts and perspectives. Yeah. Well, I think, um, we are learning now. Um, I feel like a lot of people are learning this, that, um, people, we obviously crave connection and um, when you follow someone on social media, especially creatives, um, yes, you, you should love their work, but I think a lot of times um, what creates them as like what brings them to being your client is if they connect with you personally mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um so realizing that it's not just about showing our work all the time, but also showing who we are. Um, I think, you know, we're still realizing how important that is. And mm -hmm. it's really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'm way more ready to post pictures of all different photo shoots, photo shoots of different families and couples that we do. And then, you know, every time I go to post a picture of us, like it still feels strange for some reason. Um, it's like it's vulnerable. Yeah, it's just it's interesting. Um, but we know that we we need to do that. They need to, um, you know, learn who we are and we want them to connect with us. Obviously, people um, want to look a certain way on social media most of the time. And we don't want to, um, encourage that culture. Um, we want to be real and honest. Um, and that's, that's really hard to do. Um, especially as a couple, we, we want to be, um, real about our relationship and even the, the struggles that we go through. 
um, as a married couple, um, I think it's really important that we talk about those things and that we're not just this perfect couple who Mm -hmm. works together. And because we work together, we get to travel together and, you know, we have all this time to just be together and it's all happy. And, you know, we love every single project we've ever worked on and it's just sunshine and rainbows. Um, and I think it's so easy for it to come across that way, even if we don't mean to, it can just like, and that's hard to, um, kind of combat that, but we both feel like the more honest that we can be on social media, even if it kind of goes against the norm. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, we are in the wedding industry. We are part of an industry that is trying to sell people this fairy tale Mm -hmm. love story that is, you know, basically fake. And um, so it's very interesting being on this side of it where we don't want to um, encourage that. Mm -hmm. We know that you can create an amazing relationship and there can be... um, such great connection that you can have with your partner. Um, but we never want to sell the lie that it's easy. Um, and we've joked that Mm -hmm. when Mitch becomes a counselor that, you know, we'll do engagement pictures and their wedding pictures, and then he'll do their marriage counseling. (laughs) (laughs) But no, it's just like, we, we know in our marriage, like people try to, prepare you for marriage, you know, they give you the little sayings and never go to bed without saying I love you or all these little things. Like that's great, but I don't think anybody can prepare you for what marriage really is. Um both like the good and bad sides of it. I don't think that um they can really prepare you. Um but we just want to be honest about that um on social media. And that's something that is sort of our vision for the future. I feel like we haven't even done a great job of this yet. I think it's something that we really want to work towards. And we're still, you know, in the phases of trying to figure out how do we um, promote our business, but also be real Mm -hmm. and um, it's a moving target. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. It, it feels like we're almost shooting ourselves in the foot sometimes, like, you know, talking about the hard parts of marriage, but I don't want to sell something that's fake. Um, the The connection that I feel with Mitch, even after doing marriage counseling of our own and um, doing the hard work of understanding each other with personality differences and um, everything that comes with marrying someone. Um, yeah, I feel like that has just been... Um, really helpful for us. And I want to encourage other people to take those steps, even if it is continuing, you know, getting rid of the stigma around therapy. Like it's so funny. A lot of people do premarital counseling, um, but postmarital counseling, like doing it once you're married. Now that's like something wrong. Wow. Your marriage Mm -hmm. is like in trouble. I didn't know it was that bad. Like Mm -hmm. No, it's it's really healthy. And doing that basically right after we got married was one of the best things we've ever done. Oh, um, yeah. Some people have been like, oh, you needed marriage counseling like <laughs> right after you got married. And it's like, in my mind, it's like, wow, you think we're really broken, don't you? But <laughs> it's what been honestly one of the best things we've ever done right. as a couple. So, so it's, yeah, I, I mean, we're getting a little off topic, but it's it's hard because these are all the thoughts that go through my mind with how to run our social media accounts. And, um, you know, we could keep it very simple and happy all the time and, you know, do the normal social media thing, or we can, um, you know, go the harder route, but, um, put more of ourselves into it and, um, the good, the bad and the ugly. And, you know, hoping people connect with us at the end of the day and Mm -hmm. um, want us to be there to capture, you know, moments that are special to them, knowing that we know it's not all sunshine and rainbows, like Mm -hmm. knowing that those things are a part of life, I think makes the 
the good times even sweeter and we love being there for couples on their wedding day like best day of their lives but we also want to be there if they need to talk afterwards you know down the road if they just have like stuff they want to talk about and know that we may might be able to give them a nugget of nugget or two of advice Mm -hmm. um for something to help them with their marriage so that's a lot but no yeah yeah. that was that was really good I think it's interesting because it is like well kind of like what you said these are all of your thoughts as you're posting on social media and it's I think that's the nuanced piece about um, digital marketing in general is that there's so many facets to it. There's so many different things you can be thinking about. And like also the idea that ultimately we can't control how people perceive our social media, but that's kind of what we're trying to do is like, okay, well, how are people Mm going to perceive this? How can we show up and express that, you know, we're real people behind the, behind the phone, behind the computer. Uh, But then also, Mm put forth the work that we're doing and how can we voice that in an authentic way? Um, it's, it's not an easy, um, it's not an easy, like one, one, two, three steps to, you know, post on social media, which I think is where social media has gone wrong. Um, is that so many people try to package it and it's, that's not that, like that's a whole conversation that's like could last forever. So (laughs) yeah. No, I mean, it can be exhausting at times. And the fact, again, like I I do most of the social media, but I also run a lot of things by mm-hmm. Mitch. And yeah. now we have different opinions about certain things. So yeah. trying to come at it from both of our perspectives. And um, yeah, it's just, it's really interesting going through all of that. Um, um, one, I think Rachel did an awesome job with what she said about social media, I completely echo everything she said. So the only thing I'll add to it is the fact that I did manage, um, I think three different businesses, social medias. And usually it was because I was the millennial Uh, of the group. Um, Honestly, it was like, Oh, Mitch knows how to Facebook. Let's give him that. Um, When in reality, it's so complex. I mean, we all know that it, there's no right Um, there's, there's no hard and fast right or wrong. Like you said, Megan, it's very, um, situation by situation. Um, but in our current society, in our current market, you really can't afford to play behind the curtain anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't be the wizard of Oz and put on this mighty presence, hoping that people will nibble. Um, you have to be yourself. I know you are one of the best proponents of authenticity that I know. And I, I love that. I think we all need that. Um, and to be successful, you need that in your social media. Um, the businesses that I ran, I was not able, which makes mm-hmm. sense. Um, they don't necessarily understand um, these kind of concepts as well. And I didn't either back then. I, I did a lot of trial and error. But I will say the engagement percentage, um, I don't need to get into numbers or likes or comments or anything like that, but the percentage of people that engage now in our social media, when we're able to just be ourselves, that like Rachel mm-hmm. said, the good, bad, and the ugly is so much higher. I would guesstimate at least mm-hmm. double the mm-hmm. engagement that I had in these other places, because really all they cared about, um, not Actually, that's not true. That's kind of an umbrella statement. But a lot of the purpose of posting was to sell or to market. And for us, yeah, I mean, that's a great bonus. But why do people follow us? Let's give them a reason to follow us. Let's, Mm -hmm. let's, you know, I don't want someone following us and thinking, oh, all they care about is themselves. Actually, I want them to think the opposite. I want them to think that we're here for them Mm -hmm. um, because that's really our goal. And if it is the engagement and the followers and all that stuff, that'll, that'll come. Um, But if you're authentic and you're sharing um, from the heart and, um, and you're being honest and truthful and can bring other people in that in like an encouraging me too kind of way. um, I think that is just the sweet spot, at least for us, we found um, really good things come out of that. So something that I usually think about when I think of social media too, or recently I've been thinking about it is even just this idea of like 
I'm a big proponent of people unfollowing others that are not going to be giving value into their life because I know that that's something that I just mm-hmm. recently I've become really passionate about the unfollow and even the block button. Like I've just started using it more. It's there for a reason. Like, so I've been using it and like, I try to think mm-hmm. now from the perspective of my audience is like, okay, well, am I going to be one of those people that they block or that they unfollow if they are actually following my, like, if they, you know, if they're following the advice that I'm giving, are they going to, am I going to be one of those people that they cut out because I'm just, you know, noise in their life and I don't want to be that. And that's not, I think so many of us do have really Mm -hmm. good things to say and we have really great products. We have really Mm -hmm. great services, um, but how we put them out in the world can either be noise or it can genuinely be something mm-hmm. that will people will value in their lives. Um, it's hard to yeah. do. <laughs> it is. Really it is. Yeah, it's yeah. Exhausting. There are, you know, weeks, not weeks, I should say. There have been times where a week goes by and I have not posted on our account. And it's funny because it's not because I'm not thinking about it every day or you know, that that's just in the back of my mind somewhere. It's because I cannot figure out how to come across in the correct way or even like Mm -hmm. an authentic way, but that like still, I don't know. There's so many um, parts of being a business and trying to be authentic in business. That's really tricky. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it's, it's a lot to think about and um, yeah, it's, that's the thing. I wish there was like an easy way to tell people to right. do it, but I mean, we're still learning that mm-hmm. every day. So, if anyone tells me they're an expert of social media, it always like internally I laugh because it's like I don't know if anyone could ever <laughs> really master it. You know, it's like continuous yeah. learning, mm-hmm. and I think that's kind of one of the cool things about it is that you never really arrive, mm-hmm. which is actually really similar to most things, but. um I think just having that conversation, especially with yourself, like as a business owner, what what do I even value? Mm-hmm. What are my values? And what is the business values? Like where where are my goals? Where where am I heading? And um that may look really different than our business does. Mm-hmm. So for us, um my one of my huge core values is encouragement. I, I feel like that's a gift that I've been given and I want to give that to anybody I can. So when I utilize our social media usually it's to the end of encouraging someone if you can walk away lighter after seeing a post or reading something then i feel so good like that that i really do feel like that's my purpose in life um but if rachel or someone else made that their goal it wouldn't be authentic anymore because that's Mm -hmm. something that i feel Mm -hmm. so to rachel it's very different and I love that because that gives us all room to be in the space together. We're not stepping over each other. We're all unique. We all have our own niche. Um, sometimes it's hard to find. <laughs> I, sure. I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. You know, <laughs> uh, I had a mentor who was 70 who told me that, which I always laughed at. Um, but we all have our own unique gifting and our own unique um, goals and mission and values. So like, use that Mm -hmm. don't be afraid of that business you know the business world is almost thirsty for that um they want that and um i just think it's really cool if you are able to do that and integrate that do it Mm -hmm. um because people love it and i think everyone's better off for it in the end Mm -hmm. for sure awesome well this has been such a great conversation i feel like we could continue on for a long time but, I like want to keep going. Yeah. I'm like, what are we talking about next? <laughs> I feel like eventually we should do. Um, it'd be really fun if we did like the four of us. That could be really interesting. Yeah. Um, that would be great. Well, so that's fun. like a normal night for us. Yeah. Like when we're together, we right. we talk about these conversations. So it's it's fun doing this on a different platform, not just sitting on our couches. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, super fun. I love yeah. it. Um, so before we wrap up, I would love if you could share how can we find you online and then if you have any kind of final thoughts or if you have any new releases or projects that we um, can just get to hear about um, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Um, well, on both Facebook and Instagram, it's just Mitch and Rachel Visuals. Um, 
I'm trying to think. Our website is missionrichvisuals.com. Yep. And from there, you can get everything else. Yeah. That's the easiest way to reach us. Um, I wouldn't say there's any, like, specific projects other than the fact that wedding season is upon us. Mm. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, we uh, have some... We have some really fun weddings coming up this um, this summer, specifically one that we're shooting in Montana, which mm-hmm. is going to be really fun. So, um, yeah, if you want to follow along with the, the weddings and the shoots we have this summer, then feel free to follow us. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I know, like you said, Mitch, you have like four days until you're graduated, so you have some things you're still wrapping up and finals week. <laughs> so fun. I really appreciate your time. Um, both of you. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. And I look forward to, I know we'll be chatting again soon, but, um, I look forward to maybe having you guys on again sometime this that would be summer awesome. or something. But awesome. We really enjoyed this. <laughs> yeah, we love it. Thanks for having us. Megan. For sure. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of the reclamation podcast. I hope it served you on your own reclamation journey and know that I'm rooting for you all the way. If you want to learn more about the show guests, head to the website, thereclamationpodcast.com. And if you found value in the show, five stars is always appreciated. Good things are coming for you. Bye for now.